Right now on Morning News Now, a historic catastrophe. Hawaii's governor says the wildfires that have devastated Maui are likely to be the largest natural disaster in the state's history. But this morning, progress is being made to battle the flames, with the fire in hard-hit Lahaina now said to be 80% contained. Amid the devastation, there's an outpouring of support for the survivors who were forced to flee their homes. While the number of confirmed deaths has risen to at least 55, that number is expected to rise even more. The number has been rising and we will continue to see loss of life. We also have seen many hundreds of homes destroyed. And that's going to take a great deal of time to recover from. We'll bring you the latest out of Maui and hear from a resident about his ordeal. Also this morning, doing a deal, five Americans detained in Iran have been moved to house arrest in what could be a first step toward a potential prisoner exchange with the United States. My belief is that uh, this is the beginning of the end of their nightmare and the nightmare that their families have experienced. How that deal would also include the release of billions of dollars worth of frozen Iranian assets. Deadly takedown, new video is emerging showing the moment FBI agents confronted a Utah man who had allegedly threatened to kill President Biden. What we're learning this morning about that dramatic encounter. Plus, dropping the mic from the Sugar Hill Gang to Nicki Minaj, we're looking back at 50 years of hip hop and the iconic beats that shaped America's cultural and musical landscape. Looking forward to the reporting we have coming up in the next two hours. As we continue to celebrate 50 years of hip hop. Good to have you with us, Lindsay. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Lindsay Reiser in for Savannah Sellers. We're going to begin this hour, though, with those devastating wildfires that continue to burn this morning in Hawaii. There has been some progress made, but three fires are still burning. None of them 100% contained yet. Hawaii Governor Josh Green says this is likely the largest natural disaster in the state's history. The cost of the damage could be in the billions. At least 55 people have been confirmed dead, and officials fear that number will keep rising. The recovery effort of victims is likely going to take weeks once the fires are eventually contained. President Biden has approved a national disaster declaration for Hawaii and has ordered additional federal aid. For those without a place to stay, several shelters are now open with donations being collected by organizations in the area. People have been dropping off essentials, including clothing, hygiene, products as well as food and water. The president says people on the island will have the full support of the federal government. And I've directed that we surge support to these brave firefighters and first responders and emergency personnel working around the clock there risking their lives. We're working as quickly as possible to fight these fires and evacuate residents and tourists. We have full coverage ahead. We will hear from a Hawaii resident who is dealing with the aftermath of the fires. Let's begin with NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin, who joins us from Maui with the latest. Dana, good morning. So just set the scene for us. How are things looking there and what are we hearing from officials on the ground? Joe, good morning to you. It's about 12 Actually, it's about 103 in the morning local time. Right now, we're at the Maui High School, one of the largest evacuation centers. We've seen a few people walking around. A lot of people are sleeping in their cars. Others, hundreds, likely sleeping inside. Right now, not a lot of activity going on. We are waiting for the latest update. Several hours ago, we heard from officials about the fires being 80% contained, which is significant progress, but still they have a long way to go. We also know that there's an effort to try to get cadaver dogs in from California and Washington to help search Lahaina, that historic tourist town that has been decimated by these fires. We heard also from officials about what the experience is like for them as they're sifting through the rubble and trying to fight the fire. Listen. It's still very, very hazardous in the burn areas. Things are falling every minute around us, and there have been some people that have been hurt. We're bringing in some search and rescue teams that help with cadaver dogs to look for hum human moraines, and they're on the way in right now, uh, both from California and Washington, and uh, we'll integrate them and support the great fire department you have here. A message of safety, make sure you continue to heed the warnings of local officials. Don't wait. Uh, listen to them and uh, heed their warnings. And at this hour, the roads that lead to the fire destruction 
the, the destroyed area caused by this fire remain closed. So we have not actually been able to get there. Unlike usually fires that burn in California, you get direct access, but this operation has kept us back. The only way to access that area is by boat, but we have seen a lot of images and Joe Lindsay, it's very devastating. Yeah, and so many challenges they're facing first fighting the fires and then also trying to rescue and search for some of the victims. Dana, what can you tell us about the thousands of tourists there who are still trying to get out to fly home? Where do things stand on that front? Well, at last check, uh, several tourists actually slept in the airport for at least a day trying to make their flights out. Several flights have been canceled. Still thousands remain here either in Maui or have gone to other islands like Oahu. Uh, and, and interesting enough, the business, uh, the head of the business tourist area in Hawaii actually talked about how that is actually helping the tourist air, the, the economy here because while they want people to stay away from Maui, they think it'd be great to get them to these other islands to help bolster the tourism there because this is what the state really relies on. So having everyone leave has been a big hit for them, um, but still a lot of people still trying to make it out. So a lot of people obviously desperate to get home. All right. Dana Griffin reporting from Maui. Dana, thank you so much. We are now joined once again by Dustin Kaliopu from Hawaii. Dustin, good morning. Thank you for being with us and spending some of your time during what is just such a hard period. We, we spoke to you yesterday about how things were going. You and your family actually evacuated to the other side of the island just to let everybody know at home. Tragically, you lost your home. What have the last 24 hours been like? Um, it's been um, a nightmare. I've not slept much. Every time I close my eyes, all I see is the red glow of the flames that I saw when we were evacuating. I see the kitten that we lost when we left our home that we couldn't find as we tried to evacuate. And after seeing the devastation of our whole town, all I see is the black ash, the destruction of every single building in our community. A, a nightmare indeed, Dustin. And, and when we're talking about what was lost, I mean, you just mentioned it, loss of life, uh, the kitten you were talking about. You you told the Today Show, everyone you know is homeless right now. And, and we had mentioned at the top of the show that right now there are at least 55 confirmed deaths, but officials expect that number to climb. I mean, what's your reaction to that just unimaginable figure? I mean, 55 is limited to the amount of personnel that are licensed to confirm these deaths. There are hundreds, if not thousands of people that have perished in the fires that we've experienced in this week. And I would not be surprised if that number jumps to three, if not four digits by the end of this week. Stops you in your tracks when you hear officials say that cadaver dogs have to be brought in. Um, and Dustin, I know you had mentioned communication is really hard. It's hard for you to communicate with the people that you know and, and see how they're doing and what they're experiencing. Has that improved at all? And what do the next few days look like for you? It's not improved. Um, we've been waiting for the aid that was promised by President Biden with the uh, mobilization of the military, the um, Army Reserves, the Coast Guard, everybody that they said that would be um, alerted to service this town, we've not seen any of those folks there. So I'm just happy to know that our community has made the effort to service everyone in this town that the government has not been able to help. Mm. Dustin, we certainly appreciate your time and our thoughts and our condolences are with you and your community. We hope we hope you get what you need. Thank you. Thank you. Millions in the Midwest, meanwhile, are waking up to more rain today. We do want to get a check on your morning news now weather. A meteorologist Angie Lastman is tracking those summer storms for us. Angie, good to see you. Good to see you guys as well. Good morning. Finally made it to Friday, and we've got some unsettled and really potentially dangerous weather working its way across the eastern third of the country over the next couple of days. We've got multiple days of severe weather potential. Today, it's focused across parts of the Midwest, and we've already got your satellite and radar showing some of those active thunderstorms that are happening, stretching from Missouri, uh, Minnesota 
Minnesota all the way down to Missouri. We've got places like Chicago and Green Bay, which will get some uh, shower and thunderstorm activity here in the short term. This is the frontal boundary system that we're going to continue see, to see working its way to the east. Today, this is the area that we're watching closely. Like I said, Missouri to Minnesota has the greatest chance to see some of those stronger storms. It does include the wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour, as well as the large hail. And of course, a few tornadoes can't be ruled out. This will go through the afternoon hours today into the evening hours tonight. And then the system will work its way a little farther to the east. And folks from uh, Burlington to Boston, New York, Columbus, Indianapolis, Lexington could see some strong storms developing for their Saturday plans. This is going to continue to track uh, slowly but surely, which means we'll have slow moving heavy rain. The potential for flooding will be there too, not just the, the severe weather to watch for for your Saturday plans, but also those really soggy conditions that will interrupt your outdoor activities but could lead to some flooding in the area. Those are the main threats. We'll see the winds uh, working uh, anywhere from 40, 50, even up to 60 mile per hour gusts once again possible as well as the hail. Now that system starts to work its way offshore, but the tail end of it is going to cause some problems for Sunday. So if you're looking ahead to the last day of the weekend, this is the area that we're going to see those strongest storms possible. We do have a severe probability uh, of some of those uh, popping up here as we get into the afternoon hours of your Sunday too. And on top of that, plenty of rain to go around stretching from the Midwest down through parts of the Southeast up into parts of the Northeast. We could see the highest amounts totaling anywhere from an inch to two inches, maybe localized amounts a little higher than that. So how about the heat? The temperatures, they are just, of course, not cooperating across parts of the South. We continue to see more than 60 million people under these alerts uh, for heat, including the heat advisories, the watches and the warnings. And they stretch from Miami all the way to parts of Western Texas up into parts of Kansas. This is going to be something we see through the weekend. Here's those temperatures that I know you want to know about. Triple digits across uh, Texas from really Midland to Houston, down through Del Rio, Amarillo, all over 100 degrees for the actual temperature and contending with some record highs across that area. Miami not getting a break today from the 90s. We're into the mid 90s there, 95 for Tampa. As we look ahead to tomorrow, more of the same prepare for it, especially if you're going to be spending any extended amounts of time outdoors in places like Texas, Louisiana. Those feels like temperatures are going to be brutal into the triple digits, of course, but feeling more like 115 when you add in that humidity level. Meanwhile, parts of the north uh, stay fairly nice. I mean, the really typical summer like pattern for folks there, Cincinnati into the high 80s Sunday, and then we head back into the next work week with mid 80s on Monday and upper 70s on Tuesday. Not a bad forecast for folks there. Upper 70s. Yeah, wow. sounds nice and refreshing. <laughs> it's been so long. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate it. This morning, five Americans currently imprisoned in Iran are one step closer to freedom. The U.S. government has confirmed that they have all been released from Tehran's notorious Evin prison and are now under house arrest. This move is just the first step of a planned prisoner exchange between the U.S. and Iran. And as part of the swap, some $6 billion worth of assets currently blocked under U.S. sanctions could be freed up. NBC News Tehran Bureau Chief and Correspondent Ali Ruzi joins us now from London. So good morning, Ali. What do we know about this potential deal and who are these five detained Americans? Uh, good morning, Lindsay. Well, if this proposed agreement goes through, Iran will be allowed to access around $6 billion in frozen funds held in South Korea under sanctions. Now, the funds are earmarked only to buy food, medicine, or other humanitarian uh, purposes in accordance with existing U.S. sanctions against Iran. And under the agreement, Qatar's central bank will oversee the funds. But already, Lindsay, Iranian officials are saying that the money is going to go straight into an Iranian account. So we have to keep a very close eye on the transfer details. But even if it does remain under the control of the Qataris, it still does free up about six billion dollars for the regime to spend on whatever they want at home. Um, the Iranians are also going to get prisoners held in the U.S. We don't know who they are or how many are Iranians, but the Iranian officials are saying that they'll get at least the same number of, uh, of prisoners that are being exchanged. It looks like we just lost Ali's uh, shot there. So for the, for the meantime, Ali, will thank you so much for that reporting. We do want to continue our coverage. We're going to be joined now by journalist Jason Rezaian. Jason is actually the former Tehran bureau chief for The Washington Post. He was held hostage in Iran for 544 days. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. It's important to hear your perspective. I mean, first, just your reaction to this news we just heard from Ali about the release of the five Americans. I have to imagine that brought up some strong emotions for you. Certainly. I've been tracking this uh, situation, this uh, phenomenon, since the day that I was released 
now almost eight years ago, and Iran has never stopped uh, taking Americans and citizens of other democracies hostage uh, for the last 40 years. So uh, it does bring up a lot of uh, thoughts and uh, emotions for me, but the most important one is that I'm cautiously optimistic that these five Americans and their families will be re reunited soon. They should not have been uh, separated for all this time. Uh, none of these people have done anything to warrant uh, being held in prison. And ultimately, they're just being used as leverage. So, you know, it's um, it's it's good news, but it's also uh, just the beginning of what might turn out to be a, a fairly long process. You were held in that same notorious prison there. And after your release, you actually sued the Iranian government and were awarded $180 million. C can you share a little bit about what it was like there while you were being held and what you think these prisoners have likely been experiencing? Well, I think that the, the people have to understand that um, when you're taken hostage by an adversarial government, it's really one of the uh, most um, acute types of abuse of power that a, a state can do to any individual. Uh, the entire government apparatus is being mobilized against you because of the citizenship that you you hold. Uh, so, you know, it started off uh, with my wife and I being thrown into solitary confinement where we spent many long and, and lonely days not knowing what was going on in the outside world, not knowing what was going on for each other. Uh, then I was put on trial. Um, There's no evidence, no witnesses, uh, just literally an accusation uh, out of thin air. Uh, that I had somehow been cooperating with the U.S. government, um, spying on Iran. Uh, I was there as as a accredited journalist, had been for five years. Um, so you know, and they do it over and over again. And so, to to hear about the the news that that these five will be hopefully released soon, it's 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 good. Uh, I worry that uh, not much is being done to deter Iran from, from doing this in the future, and I hope the Biden administration is working to cultivate some credible deterrence policies. What, what do you think could be key to trying to deter this from happening again? Well, look, hostage taking is something that has gone on not only in Iran, but around the world for centuries. Uh, so really kind of grinding down and figuring out what the motivations are. Uh, for the for the governments that do this, in Iran's case, it's usually financial. So you have to uh, make the uh, the hostage taking more expensive than what they think to get out of it, which is you know one reason why we have sanctions and and other asset seizures. Uh, in Russia's case, it's often a human asset. You know, there are spies that they want to get back, uh, and in in return, they're freeing innocent Americans. Uh, but you know, I think really taking a, a, a no tolerance policy internationally is something that, that governments haven't done. Uh, and there should be a convention around hostage taking and that, uh, you know, if, if a citizen of one of our allied nations is taken, that we're going to stand with them and use the full force of our uh, capabilities to bring those people home. Jason, in 2019, you wrote a book about your experience. It was titled Prisoner, My 544 Days in an Iranian Prison, Solitary Confinement, a Sham Trial, High Stakes Diplomacy, and the Extraordinary Efforts It Took to Get Me Out. That, that title speaks volumes about your experience. I mean, just for you, what, why was it so important to be so forthcoming about your experience? And what was it like? I mean, you're a writer, but writing the book and reliving some of those memories. Yeah, you know, I think uh, writing the book and also the lawsuit that you mentioned, I should I should acknowledge that while the U.S. government uh, and, and a federal court uh, awarded me $100 million, that doesn't mean you get paid $180 million. <laughs> uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, for me, it was presenting uh, my version of events, which was what actually happened, and then lodging them in uh, in in the in the court system. Uh, because the the official version of events up to that point, up to the point that my book came out and that I filed this lawsuit against Iran, um, was the Iranian state propaganda version, uh, which was used to not only sully my reputation, but uh, really destroy my life in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, I think you get some of that back, uh, but I still, uh, on a on a daily basis, receive death threats from the uh, supporters of the Iranian regime. 
uh, the Iranian state television put out a 30 part um, narrative series supposedly based on all the crimes that I committed against the country. Um, and, you know, anytime they replay that, uh, I get a barrage of, of threats to me and my family. It sounds crazy, but, um, you know, uh, it's it's been my um, my experience over the last decade. It, it's an unreal experience. We are still so glad you are okay, and we thank you for joining us this morning to give your perspective in the wake of these latest headlines. Jason Rezaian, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Turning now to Washington, where Judge Ch Tanya Chutkin will hear arguments today on a request for a protective order. This is part of the federal interference case against former President Donald Trump. And the judge will decide whether to impose an order barring Trump and his legal team from sharing evidence with the public. Prosecutors say the move is necessary for a number of reasons, including keeping witnesses from being intimidated by the former president. But Trump is pushing back, saying the move will violate his First Amendment right to free speech. The hearing comes nearly two weeks after Trump was indicted on four felony charges, including conspiracy to defraud the nation. The former president pleaded not guilty in court and has repeatedly denied any wrongdoing. Let's bring in NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley from outside the Washington, D.C. courthouse, along with civil rights attorney and former prosecutor David Henderson. So, Ryan, good morning. Let's start with you. A magistrate judge oversaw Trump's court uh, arraignment. So this will really be the first time the defense and prosecutors are appearing before Judge Chuck. And walk us through what we can expect and remind us what we know about the judge. Yeah, and I think Judge Shrekin really wanted to set expectations here because as soon as there was this disagreement, she set this court date. Originally, uh, the first hearing wasn't supposed to be until later this month, at which point they were going to decide when they were going to set this case for trial. She had already sort of gotten that process moving and had the magistrate judge during that first hearing make clear these were the dates, here's the deadlines, here's what's going to happen. But there is now this dispute over the discovery because Jack Smith's team says they want to turn over as much information as they can as soon as possible. But in order to do that, they need to have an agreement in place about what they're able, what the Trump team is able to share, because there's going to be a lot of sensitive information that is included in there. And especially given the rhetoric that Donald Trump has used against judges in this case and others, as well as uh, potential witnesses and some of the language he had even over uh, even last week, um, the the. Jack Smith's team is very worried about what he could do, just sharing grand jury information, individuals who are expected to testify, uh, potentially um, interfering with the uh, with with how this case would move forward is what they're mainly concerned about there. Uh, Trump's team has said that this would uh, interfere with his First Amendment rights. But, you know, an important thing to note here is that frequently uh, criminal defendants who are on pretrial release, Donald Trump in this case, uh, who is actually charged in two separate federal cases, um, are typically denied or restricted um, on some of their abilities. Sometimes that's in the form of freedom. Sometimes you're held pre-trial if a judge determines uh, that's necessary. There are just restrictions on what you're able to do. There are conditions on your travel often. Uh, so this isn't entirely unusual, though, of course, there are a lot of uh, bring your issues here because, of course, in this case, the criminal defendant is running for president of the United States. David, we now know prosecutors want to set a trial date here for January 2nd, according to a court filing from special counsel Jack Smith's office. The government thinks it's going to take them up to six weeks to present this case. So what do you make of that timeline? Does it give us any insight into what kind of case or evidence or even witnesses we might expect? Well, Joe, there's a lot of overlap between that request for the timeline and the issue that we're already discussing with this protective order, because school's about to start back up. You can't do anything without your school supplies, especially your books. That's why the prosecutors are saying we need to get this information to him so he can start getting ready for trial. The challenge with the January trial date is that basically this is one of three criminal cases. This one got started later than the others, and you're trying to push it to trial earlier, which means it's probably going to get set back. Now, as I say that, Every day today in every part of our country, people are going to be facing charges more serious than the ones that President Trump is facing because they could go to jail for life or even be put to death, and they will have less time than roughly five months to get ready for trial. So it is feasible. It does make sense for this trial to go first. But even if they did get a January trial date, which I doubt they will, it will get pushed back because of delays like what we're discussing with this protective order. David, what are your thoughts on the arguments for and against this protective order? What kind of latitude does, does the judge have in this case? 
In a nutshell, the judge can do whatever she wants to with the protective order because it's entirely up to her. The arguments here are silly because they don't really have anything to do with the protective order. The, and the one on the one hand, Trump is saying, I need time to get ready for trial, so you need to move my trial date back. But at the same time, he's saying, well, hang on, I'm not ready to get any of this information yet because we haven't worked out this deal about the protective order. You would think it's an issue of first impression when you say that, right? but he has a protective order in his Florida case. So the question should become, why not just use the same protective order you've got in Florida? And there's no clear answer to that, except that they want to be able to argue about this, in addition to the fact that the protective order is necessary to keep people safe. I used to prosecute domestic violence cases. So in those cases, you have to make sure that the person who was assaulted is kept safe from the assailant by not giving out phone numbers, addresses, personal identification information. The same is true when someone gets on social media and says, you come after me, I'm coming after you. There's an obligation to keep people safe by protecting certain pieces of information. Speaking of safety, Ryan, we're, we're learning security has been increased for Judge Chutkin. Real quickly, what more can you tell us about that? And is it common for federal judges to get a protective detail? That's right. You know, last week, Judge Shuckin was freely roaming around the courthouse behind me. Uh, but just yesterday, our own Daniel Barnes spotted her with three different uh, U.S. marshals being escorted around the courtroom just when she was going basically to get a coffee down in the cafeteria. So definitely an increased presence, 24-7 um, security in this case. And, you know, frankly, it's because this is going to get ugly. And we've seen uh, this get ugly in January 6th cases before and a lot of racial attacks on her. Um, and that's something I think we can certainly expect going forward, especially if Trump continues to uh, put his ire on the judge here. All right, Ryan Riley and David Henderson, thank you both so much. We also have an update on the classified documents case. The arraignment of one of Trump's co-defendants in Florida has been delayed once again. Carlos de Oliveira is a Mar-a-Lago property manager who was charged in Jack Smith's updated indictment last month. He's charged with conspiracy with Trump and, and Walt Nada, that's Trump's personal aide. They're accused of blocking efforts by federal investigators to get sensitive files back from Trump after he left office. De Oliveira appeared in court yesterday for his arraignment, but he did not enter a plea. That's because his Florida-based attorney had not notified the court that he was representing him. His arraignment has now been rescheduled for next Tuesday. Nada also appeared in court and pleaded not guilty to the new charges. Coming up, dramatic new images of that FBI encounter with the Utah man accused of threatening to kill President Biden. Plus, there are new details in that shocking assassination of an Ecuadorian presidential candidate. That's coming up next. Virgin Galactic is celebrating a major milestone this morning after launching its first flight of space tourists into low orbit yesterday morning. NBC News Now anchor Gotti Schwartz sat down with the crew to talk about their amazing experience. Three, two, one, release, release, release. This is the moment. <laughs> it all changed for these newly minted space voyagers, not test pilots or trained astronauts, but ordinary people. We're in the vertical, headed towards space. They rocketed at three times the speed of sound to an altitude of more than 50 miles and then zero G. Zero gravity felt like nothingness. It was the most peaceful, serene moment ever where everything just stopped. Natives of Antigua, Keisha Shahoff and her 18-year-old daughter, Anna, are not only the first mother and daughter duo to reach space, they're also the first female astronauts from the Caribbean. What do you hope little girls back on the island seeing this happen feel after seeing what you guys went through? I hope they feel invincible. Like, it's okay to dream. It's okay to have these crazy dreams. And a hero's welcome for John Goodwin from his wife of 52 years. The former British Olympian who's battling Parkinson's disease bought his ticket back in 2005, waiting nearly two decades for this view. Even at 80 years of age with Parkinson's, I can do it. A 60-minute flight that for these trailblazing tourists will last a lifetime. It was so beautiful, just breathtaking, and I just felt this total connection. It's something so deep within yourself, like that feeling that you have in your heart when you just know that you love someone or something so truly. Much needed perspective from a spaceship called Unity. Gary Schwartz, NBC News, Upham, New Mexico.
Well, the social media influencer who held a game console giveaway that led to a riot last week in New York City's Union Square is breaking his silence in a Twitch stream. NBC News correspondent Valerie Castro has the details. I already know there's a lot of chat. Speaking publicly for the first time, social media influencer Kai Sanat condemning the mayhem he's accused of instigating in a New York City neighborhood. I am beyond, bro, disappointed. Beyond, bro, beyond disappointed in anybody who became destructive that day, bro. 100 percent, bro. That is not cool. My in contrast to the message he sent to his millions of social media fans a week earlier, announcing a video gaming giveaway on his Twitch live stream, seemingly aware that things could get, quote, rowdy. 14th Street, Union Square Park, NYC, starting at 4 o'clock. My nigga might end really quick on depending on how rowdy it gets. Now, look, it is a public area, so we don't know. Anything can happen, bro. Anything can happen. What did happen sent the NYPD scrambling to call in resources from all five boroughs to manage the mob. You are ordered to disperse. The crowd, made up of mostly minors, exploding into a mass of people, soon becoming unruly and violent. Police making arrests among the commotion while some in the crowd destroyed property, climbing on top of a newly renovated subway entrance and this food truck, even setting off fireworks. After Friday, bro, I've come to realize the amount of not only power but influence that I have on people. Sanat, at first, live streaming the crush of people around him. Where the park at? But later, the NYPD pulling the influencer out of the crowd and taking him into custody. He was eventually released from this police precinct with a desk appearance ticket for inciting to riot and unlawful assembly, according to the NYPD. I had to chill for a little bit due to the fact that, one, I got court dates that I got to appear to. My first court date, August 16th. You feel me? I got charges and stuff like that. So y'all not going to be seeing me for a little bit. Sanat vowing that the next time, if there is one, things will be different. I spoke to myself. I said, yo, Kai, next time you want to do any of, the, any of these things like this, you need to hit up the right people, make the right calls, and do it the correct way. Because as a whole, bro, we all have to do better. Our thanks to Valerie Castro for that report. Our legal analyst, Danny Savalas, told us it's unlikely this influencer will face jail time, but he could be held responsible for damage to property in a civil suit if it gets to that point. Well, still to come, a crafty way to fight climate change. How a special new paint could help the environment and cool your home at the same time. We'll have the details next. We are back now with the effort to keep children from going hungry at school. During the pandemic, Congress approved free school meals for all kids, but that's expired, leaving states to figure out what to do next. NBC News correspondent Stephen Romo shows us how Massachusetts became the eighth state to fund universal free school meals. The pain of hunger can make learning much harder, which is why Massachusetts is joining a small group of states signing on to a universal free school meal program. It's a big relief, um, especially for families. Nobody wants to see a child go hungry. And unfortunately for some of our children, that could be the only meal that they receive during the day. Governor Maura Healey signing the state's budget Wednesday, approving funding for that program. So their bellies won't be grumbling in their schools while they're trying to get work done. The state effort is estimated to save families $1,200 per student per year. Enjoy your lunch. An issue that goes far beyond state borders. More than 9 million children still faced hunger in 2021. A popular pandemic era federal program meant to address this made free school meals available to all children, regardless of family income. There is that sense of pride um, as a parent or as a guardian, uh, what have you, that you don't want people to know that you're struggling. To see this all happen and watch us collectively go through this, uh, this financial crisis, this pandemic, um, watching people struggle, it's extremely heartbreaking. But funding dried up last year. 
meaning it's up to each state or individual school districts to figure out what to do next. There are campaigns in more than 20 states across the country pushing for universal free school meals, but Massachusetts is only the eighth state to get the plan across the finish line. We know that when kids are hungry, they can't focus, they can't concentrate, they can't learn. And so by making sure that every child in this country is in class, well nourished and ready to learn, will have a huge impact on the economy, on kids' outcomes. Our thanks to Stephen Romo for that report. Some states temporarily extended these free meals after the federal funds ended, but for the ones that didn't, student meal debt started piling up, leaving districts to figure out what to do. Some of them have sent the accounts to collection agencies or even punish the students by making them sit out activities. Despite all of this, the Food Research and Action Center says their polling shows 63% national support for permanent universal free student meals. Time for financial headlines now, starting with a high-profile settlement that's being blocked by the Supreme Court. CNBC's Pippa Stevens joins us now with more on that and other money news. Good morning, Pippa. Good morning. While the Supreme Court has temporarily blocked the nationwide settlement with OxyContin maker Purdue Pharma, it would shield members of the Sackler family from civil lawsuits over the company's role in the opioid epidemic. The court agreeing to a request from the Biden administration to halt the agreement reached last year with state and local governments. The justices will hear arguments by the end of this year over whether the settlement can proceed. Meantime, negotiators for striking writers and the major Hollywood studios will return to the bargaining table today. The two sides met briefly a week ago, and the Writers Guild says the studios are expected to respond to the union's proposals. Top issues include the payment of residuals in the streaming era and the use of artificial intelligence. The writer's strike has now gone past 100 days while the actor's strike is almost a month old. And the messy effect is real. The owner of Inter Miami says the number of subscribers to the MLS season pass on Apple TV Plus has more than doubled since superstar Lionel Messi joined the club. Apple hasn't confirmed those numbers, but CEO Tim Cook did call out Messi's contribution when the company reported earnings. Inter Miami says more than half of the viewers of Messi's games are watching in Spanish. MLS season pass costs $14.99 a month or $12.99 a month for Apple TV Plus subscribers. There's no doubt Messi is a, is a worldwide superstar. Yeah, the Messi effect. Pippa, thank you so much. Now to the latest, the fight against climate change. Scientists at Purdue University have come up with a creative way to try and help the environment. And it's all through a paint that can cool down your home, maybe even your neighborhood. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa explains how it works. Inside this engineering lab on Purdue University's flagship Indiana campus, researchers are cooking up something cool. A paint so white it bounces heat from the sun back into deep space. It could help cool surfaces, homes, potentially even entire cities, tempering the extreme heat that's become more common in our climate crisis. Emily Barber is a PhD student helping to create the paint. Just to be very clear, to a layman, these might look identical. Which one has your paint on it? So this is going to be our paint. I do just want to point out the artistic detail <laughs> yeah. here. It's lovely. It's very this lifelike. Is, uh, this is Jack. So what we're doing here is we're going to take this IR thermometer and we're going to use it to tell the temperature of the commercial roof versus our paint. Okay. And so right first we're going to point it at the commercial roof here. We can see that the temperature of the roof is around 89 degrees. And then the temperature of our roof, if we point it there, is gonna be around 74 degrees. 74 compared to 89? Yes, so we already see a difference of around 15 degrees. The difference can be felt inside these model homes as well. Those painted that bright white are cooler, which could also reduce homeowners' energy costs, researchers say, anywhere from 10 to 40%. We can see how much potential air conditioning they can save. Um, and we see uh, here we see around a four degree Fahrenheit difference. Clearly Jack is happier in this house. I think so, yeah. I think he's panting a little bit less. We wanted to save energy at the beginning and uh, help homeowners to cut their cooling bills. Professor Ruan leads the research. We're able to achieve the best performance 
that can reflect as much as 98.1 percent of sunlight. 98.1 percent of sunlight. sunlight. Yes. That groundbreaking reflection, the result of creating super white pigment with components like barium sulfate, also used in the production of cosmetics and photo paper. It reflects rays from the sun like UV, which the eye can't see, instead of absorbing them. After almost a decade of manipulating the shapes of molecules and formulas, the Purdue team believes its work watching paint dry has produced extraordinary potential to counter rising temperatures. Specifically, it's hoping to help in so-called concrete jungles, where in America, 80% of the population lives. Temperatures are boosted by 8 degrees or more in a number of cities known as urban heat islands. Ruan's pitch, paint the cities white. At least... In part, they can be scattered at the different locations, like roofs, um, other infrastructures, um, road curb size. Think the iconic white villas in Greece, balconies in Barcelona. This could bring things to the next level. Are we talking all white cities, all white neighborhoods? We don't need to paint the entire city white. The priority is to deploy these to the hottest and dry climate zones. The research earning the team wide ranging recognition, including from the Guinness Book of World Records, which in its 2022 edition dubbed this the whitest paint ever created. Came as a surprise. We never expected that. Ruan's team floored by the white hot spotlight, but determined not to lose focus in a race against time to combat a man made crisis. Fascinating. Thanks to Maggie Vespa for that report. Dr. Ruan and his team are also developing the paints in different colors that use ultra white as a base. Well, coming up, marking 50 years of a movement. We're grabbing the mic to talk about the last 50 years of hip hop as we take a closer look at the most iconic moments to grace America's musical scene. Welcome back. You know the phrase, it's easy as riding a bike. Well, this is a little bit harder. Alaskan cyclist Will Walker is aiming to set a Guinness World Record for riding his bike backwards. He makes it look so easy. Last week, he completed a 500-mile bike ride across Iowa backwards. Walker adopted this unique skill 10 years ago. He says he loves riding his bike like this. He says it's easier. It feels good for the quads. The current official record is 209 miles set by an Australian cyclist in 2013. Walker is waiting for official confirmation from the folks at Guinness that he now holds the world record. Pretty unique skill there. Well, this morning, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop. It's not just a genre of music. It's a global movement. And hip hop as a whole has helped shape not only the music industry, but also American culture. Mon Copper Conte joins us now. She's a staff writer at Rolling Stone. Uh, thank you for being with us, and Good morning. How would you define hip hop? Good morning. It's so interesting to think about it, right, because it's so pervasive. It's been so definitive to me and a whole generation, generations of people. But I think from the beginning, it's been broken down into its essence through like four four uh, main pillars, right? And so I think the thing that makes hip hop hip hop, of course, is like emceeing, right? That's the rapping. Um, that's getting on the mic and telling a story, uh, telling your story. Um, and then that was uh sort of uh, accompanied by DJing in the beginning too, right? And so whereas that has progressed into what we know um, now as the really big and wide encompassing world of musical production, creating a beat, creating a sound escape from nothing. In the beginning, that started with kids in New York taking records that they had in their family home and playing them at the breaks um, and creating a whole new sound with music that had already existed. Um, and then, of course, what do you do to music? You dance, right? So the third element of hip hop is breaking. But that has evolved from like break dancing to all sorts of movement that defines hip hop, from leaning with it and rocking with it, from like when I was in middle school to what the kids are doing now with their hips on TikTok, right? Like that's all dancing. That evolves from the culture of breaking. Um, and then last, the last pillar of hip hop is graffiti. And that's another thing that is evolved, right? You know, that started out as an art form where people who had resources, um, art programs stripped out of their schools, making art where they could. And now when we think about the world of hip hop, I think graffiti translates to all the visual art that exists around the genre, from album covers to music videos to fashion. 
And Mon Kapur, a lot of people credit DJ Cool Herc for starting the movement. I actually listened to Herc and his sister Cindy Campbell talk about the birth of this movement, and she said it all came out of love. Tell us about that moment. Yeah, I mean, we're celebrating it today, right? Because 50 years ago, uh, Herc and his sister Cindy were throwing a back to school school party at their apartment in the Bronx. Uh, and so what Herc was doing there was so innovative. You know, he was a teenage immigrant from Jamaica living in New York. Um, and he uh, really innovated the style of playing these breaks on turntables. Um, and so when they threw this party, he was both the DJ and the MC getting on the mic, do, like doing his thing, you know, talking his talk and creating the vibe um, at this party that like now permeates so many of our gatherings, so many of our social institutions today. Man Kapoor, who are the artists who you think have had just the biggest impact on hip hop? You know, like I just actually uh, participated in a Grammy panel um, where they just uh, created a list of 50 hip hop artists that completely changed the genre and essentially the world. And so there's more than 50. We could keep going, right? But when I think about um, people who are not necessarily unsung, but like if I want to think about the people who um, their impact on hip hop resonates most with me, and I know that that is also a big global movement that they've helped kick off and um, carry it forward. Um, I think about people like DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, right, who we know now the Fresh Prince is Will Smith, um, but they were the first rap act to win a Grammy for rap, you know, like, and his music, their music together was so accessible. Um, you know, songs like Parents Just Don't Understand, it didn't matter if you were from the Bronx or if you were from Philly, you know, like Grammy, like the Grammy website wrote in their description of them as a rap act, like, anybody could tap into the frequency that DJ Jazzy Jeff and Will Smith were providing. Um, another artist that I think mm -hmm. about, if we were to sort of fast forward a little bit, right, is an yeah. artist named Chief Keef from Chicago. Um, if we think about music like Drill, um, which is a, a international subgenre of rap, um, so much of that is based off of a style that Chief Keef really popularized in Chicago. Yeah. And there is no ice ice without <laughs> Chief Keef. Wow, all right. Um, and, you know, I could keep going. You could, I know. My goodness, this is such a great we conversation. <laughs> we are out of time, but Mankapur Kante, we thank you so much for joining us for this great conversation this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Good right Friday morning. morning. I'm Lindsay Reiser in for Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Developing this morning, the death toll rises in Hawaii from those devastating Maui wildfires. At least 55 are confirmed dead as firefighters work to contain multiple hot spots on the island. There is some good news in the hard hit community of Lahaina. The flames that reduced many major landmarks there to smoldering rubble are now nearly contained. We've got team coverage this morning with the harrowing stories of survival and the latest efforts to get the fires under control. Also this morning, a critical hearing for former President Trump today over special counsel Jack Smith's possible protective order in the election interference probe. We're going to break down what it could mean for his run for the White House. Plus, brace for impact in a summer when we have already seen extreme weather of all kinds. Well, this morning we have a new warning. Forecasters are now predicting an above normal hurricane season. More on what that means and what's behind this revised forecast. And we'll wrap up the week with your can't miss list. We're going to tell you about the big streamers that are serving up some fresh binge worthy content for your weekend. I look forward to that second. Choose to. <laughs> Tell me what I need to watch. It, it fills up your weekend yes, plans, doesn't exactly. it? That is oh, the that point. That sounds good. Your can't miss list. Good to have you with us. We're going to begin this hour with the latest on the wildfires that are ravaging the state of Hawaii this morning. Six fires continue to burn on Maui and the Big Island, but responders say they're slowly making progress. At least 55 people have been confirmed dead, but it will likely take several weeks before officials note the final count of victims. Hawaii Governor Josh Green says it will be years before the West Maui town of Lahaina is rebuilt. He says well over a thousand buildings have been destroyed after surveying some of the damage yesterday. President Biden has pledged the full support of the government offering assistance to those in need. And United Airlines has canceled some flights so empty planes could be flown to Maui to help tourists fly home. Let's begin this hour with NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer with the latest from Maui. 
Good morning. As that death toll continues to rise, now at 55, authorities are concerned they'll find even more bodies. By one account, upwards of 1,000 people may still be missing. Firefighters and emergency teams here on the ground are winning some battles and losing others. On the island streets where residents made harrowing escapes through raging walls of fire. Just go out! So many others did not. This wildfire, now the second deadliest in modern U.S. history. I do not know what the final number is going to be. Um, and, and, and it's going to be horrible and tragic. It's a community. And so the, the amount of loss is, is incredible. In this skeletal and now desolate landscape, without power, internet, or even radio coverage, officials say they have no way to determine how many are still missing. Authorities say hundreds of homes have been lost, a growing tally that's personal for families like Patrick Sullivan's. How do you describe the emotions that you're feeling right now? Well, right here, it's pretty tough. <laughs> but uh, we'll be okay. From the air and on the ground, the National Guard is helping crews battle at least three wildfires still burning on Maui, the hardest hit areas still impossible to access. Kimo Kirkman grieving the loss of his home and his father's ashes. And I found some of these old pictures and I said, well, I should take a picture of it. And I'm so thankful I did because this is the only thing I have now. Even boats in Lahaina Harbor were consumed by the inferno. As the fire came across this area, victims say they were running as fast as the flames. Many jumped right into this harbor to save their lives. While the ocean provided an escape route for some. If anybody's still out here, it's time to go. It's time to go. Not all who reached the shore survived. Residents say they found bodies floating in the water. Caught with almost no warning, others perished in their homes or were trapped in vehicles. An entire community surrounded by loss with one sign of historic hope. The town's famous banyan tree is the only landmark left standing. After 80 mile per hour winds first kicked up this blaze and pushed it out of control, the weather conditions here are improving. Meantime, firefighters on the ground as they continue to gain the upper hand say they are still searching for the missing. Back to you. Miguel, thank you. We're joined now by May Vedelin Lee from Hawaii, who has been dealing with these wildfires. May, good morning. Thank you for being with us. I know it has been an unreal past couple days for you. Just how are you doing right now? And tell us a little about what the last couple of days have been like for you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it's just been, um, I, don't, I'm, I just saw the footage you just showed and it was just a little overwhelming to get it. This, this footage, I haven't seen all of it. so. It's just been a, it's been a nightmare. It's been a nightmare just to put it. Um, yeah, we, yeah, I don't even know where to begin. It's just been, I'm just lucky to be alive. Honestly, I'm lucky I get out of there when I did. It was just uh, the worst scenario possible times 10. It's uh, seeing everything you love, seeing your whole life just go up in flames, literally go up in flames in front of you and try to stay calm enough to, to, to get safely out of there. It's just not knowing if you're gonna live, not knowing where anybody is. Everybody was on their own, you know? It was just, it was pure survival mode. It was primal. It was, I don't, I don't even know how to put it in words, honestly. Were you at your home when you started to get word of the fire and just how much notice did you get? How much time did you have before you had to flee? We, we were kind of watching the smoke, but we couldn't tell how far, my neighbors and I, we were just kind of hanging. I live about a block away from the Banyan tree. So I'm, I live in the heart of Lahaina. And uh, I would say from beginning, from when we saw the smoke to when I had to leave, it was a couple of hours, but we're, from when we realized we have to go, it was minutes, minutes. It was, it happened so fast. The smoke jumped, the, the fire jumped, explosions were happening and once a tree, a palm tree about 50 yards away from me caught on fire, it was it was time to go, you know? It was minutes. Were you able, was everyone in your family, your neighbors, as far as you know, was everyone able to get to a safer area? I got a hold of the last of my neighbors about three hours ago. 
Um, so everybody, I, I think almost everyone I know has been accounted for at this point, almost. I mean, in my most immediate um, circle. That must um, be- But there's still, I'm sorry? That must be such a relief to hear. Oh, it's been, yesterday was um, a very, and all this disaster was kind of a beautiful day. It was a lot of, a lot of messages from people you didn't know if they were alive or not. So there has been silver linings, but they're not, they're not very bright, the silver linings. It's just, yeah, it's a, it's a shock. It's a shock. It's a shock and disbelief, honestly, at this point. It's going to take, obviously, a good deal of time to recover. What, what's your focus on right now in this moment? In this moment, it's just getting a hold of people, knowing people are okay, knowing people have a place to stay. There's still really, really poor cell service on the west side in Lahaina. I get out, I'm on the other side of the island in central Maui, and I have service, but not everybody does over there. So the focus is still just to get a hold of people and make sure they're okay. What's your biggest hope moving forward? That we can rebuild. Lahaina is a... Lahaina is a very special community. It's, uh, it, 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 we've been through a lot in these last few years and we're close. And I just pray that we can, that we can rebuild and that the focus can be us and not tourism, that it can be us. We're a, we're a local town full of families and amazing human beings and we need to rebuild this town for us. That's my hope is that we can do that. So many people are echoing that resilient spirit that you're displaying right now. In this moment, just what are the most pressing things that you, your family, your community need right now? We just need, we need, we need supplies. We need food. We need water. We need, we need everything, honestly. We need anybody who has any kind of home here they don't use to step up. And every, there's going to be thousands and thousands of people that need a place to stay. And... That to me is the most pressing part. We need, we need supplies and a roof over our heads. That's really the main thing. We know so many people are already hearing that call and we expect many more to do whatever they can to try and help you out. Yeah. May Vedalyn Lee, we thank you for your time this morning during this tough time. Please keep us updated on how you and your community are doing, okay? Thank you. All right, thank you. Supplies on a roof over our head. Incredible interview there. All right, we're going to switch gears now and talk about the dangerously high temperatures expected again across the south. Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us with your morning news now weather. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. We are starting off this Friday with warm temperatures again expected uh, across much of the south. This is another day with record highs. We already have heat alerts in place out west, a much nicer day. We'll have some severe storms across parts of the Midwest and the southeast, but it's the heat that will get your attention as you step out the door. Here's the folks that are in those heat alerts right now. We have more than 68 nearly 70 million people uh, are, are under these heat alerts at this time. It includes places like Dallas, Oklahoma City, Austin, Jackson, stretching all the way down to Miami. These are areas that have had continuous heat, really oppressive afternoon temperatures, and that goes for today, too. Triple-digit uh, temperatures are expected in Houston. We're headed to 104, just two degrees shy of what a record would be for the day. Expecting a record high in Midland with 107. New Orleans will head to 101. That would be a record as well for this date. And you can see from Tallahassee to Miami temperatures well into the 90s and we know this area with humidity it'll feel much warmer than that uh, triple digits expected maybe 110 115 across much of the south for those feels like temperatures not just today but for tomorrow too if you have outdoor plans that keep you outdoors for extended period maybe you're doing yard work make sure you're taking those frequent breaks checking on your neighbors anyone that's a little vulnerable especially during the, the uh, these conditions you'll want to make sure that you're checking in getting all that extra hydration this will be some Something that we deal with well through the weekend and even into early next week doesn't look like a lot of a break from that relief or from that heat here as we get into the next couple of days. Meanwhile, uh, parts of uh, the Northeast, the Midwest, temperatures uh, on the cooler side for some, especially as we get into places uh, like Minneapolis on Sunday, Monday into the mid 70s. We'll hang out into the 80s for Sunday in Cincinnati, and we roll into next week with temperatures falling back into those upper 70s. So it'll be mild uh, for some folks there as we round out the weekend, but we will also deal with some showers and thunderstorms that
could be impactful for some weekend plans. Uh, that line of thunderstorms already getting going for parts of the Midwest from Green Bay down the, through St. Louis. Really, if you live anywhere from Missouri to Minnesota, some stronger storms are expected later today. It's not just the rain that might impact your travel, but it's also those uh, severe risks for hail, wind damage. We know trees down and things like that can happen when we have that strong of wind. So that's something to watch for today. And that severe threat will move a little farther to the east for parts of the northeast as we get into tomorrow. All right, Angie, thank you so much. This morning, five Americans who have been imprisoned in Iran are one step closer to coming home. U.S. government officials have confirmed the five people are being moved to house arrest as part of a U.S.-Iran prisoner swap. In exchange, nearly $6 billion worth of assets currently blocked under U.S. sanctions could be released. NBC chief foreign affairs correspondent Andrea Mitchell has more on what's next for those prisoners. Five Americans are out of Tehran's notorious Evan prison and temporarily under house arrest in Iran. My belief is that uh, this is the beginning of the end of their nightmare and the nightmare that their families have experienced. Before they can come home, Iran will get $6 billion of its oil revenue for humanitarian needs. Eventually, the U.S. is also expected to release several Iranians from American jails. Held the longest, Siamak Namazi, a business consultant arrested in 2015. Murad Tabas, an environmentalist, was imprisoned in 2018 and his wife not permitted to leave Iran. Tell us um, about the experience of having your parents there and not knowing how to get them home. It's obviously been a nightmare that you couldn't imagine. Imad Shargi was also arrested in 2018. His daughters told us last year the wait was agonizing, especially when a fire broke out in the prison. We thought he was dead. Um, we didn't get to speak to him for two days. Moving the $6 billion for Iran's use could take weeks. Washington Post journalist Jason Rezaian, jailed in Tehran for almost two years, knows what they're feeling. That kind of first taste of freedom, your shoulders start to loosen up just a little bit, but they don't fully uh, relax until you're out of Iranian airspace. A source familiar says separate talks could lead to an informal deal to freeze Iran's nuclear program, which U.S. officials say is only weeks away from having enough fuel for a weapon. Andrew Mitchell, thank you. To Washington now and a key hearing today in the election interference case against former President Donald Trump. A judge will hear arguments related to the prosecution's request for a protective order. Special counsel Jack Smith wants Trump barred from sharing with the public any evidence that's given to his legal team. He argues any information that's made public could not only interfere with ongoing investigations, but may also intimidate potential witnesses in the case. Trump says the order would violate his right to free speech. Prosecutors are also requesting the trial for this case be set for January 2nd, early next year. Judge Tanya Chutkin is expected to address that motion in the next hearing, which is set for August 28th. New details are emerging in that fatal FBI shooting of a Utah man accused of making violent threats against the president and other officials. We have new video of the confrontation between agents and the suspect as they attempted to serve him a warrant. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell joins us now with the latest. Kelly, good morning. Good morning, Lindsay. This is a review of the shooting now underway by the FBI, and it's conducted by a separate division of the Bureau. They are on the ground in Utah, and what's included in that is their protocol is talking to every officer and agent who was on the scene, conducting forensics to determine how many shots were fired, including needing to determine if the suspect fired his weapon. And we're learning more about what happened. New details this morning about that fatal FBI shooting in Utah when the FBI came to arrest Craig Robertson for threatening to assassinate President Biden, Vice President Harris, and other officials. Robertson was armed, a senior law enforcement official tells NBC News, and he pointed his weapon at federal agents and did not comply with their commands. This video recorded at the scene early Wednesday. Robertson was shot and killed inside an entry of his Provo home, NBC News has learned. Not far from where President Biden was expected to arrive hours later. Ultimately, there was a threat posed to an agent, an agent fired back. The 75-year-old woodworker displayed his cache of weapons and graphic talk about violent attacks online. A law enforcement source says former President Trump's social media platform, Truth Social, 
alerted authorities in March about the alarming nature of Robertson's threatening comments. Truth Social has not responded to NBC News' request for comment. On his accounts, Robertson declared himself a MAGA Trumper and described part of his arsenal as a Democrat eradicator. The FBI said Robertson showed an intent to kill President Biden and Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, who is prosecuting the hush money case against Mr. Trump. A senior law enforcement official also tells me that the agents who conduct intelligence on assassination threats don't like to release data on how many they believe are out there because they say re research shows that that kind of publicity can draw out copycats. Lindsay? Okay, Kelly O'Donnell, thank you. Coming up on this hour of morning news now, first it was Netflix, now Disney Plus cracking down on password sharing. So what does this mean for your streaming experience? We're going to take a closer look. But first, new legal developments in America's opioid crisis. A major settlement for the company behind Oxycontin now put on hold by the Supreme Court. Those stories and much more after this. We're back now with a new development tied to the nation's opioid crisis. Yesterday, the Supreme Court temporarily blocked a massive bankruptcy deal with Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin. At issue is whether the Sackler family, which owned the company that made OxyContin, should be released from any future liability as part of the settlement. NBC News correspondent Ann Thompson joins us now with more on this. Ann, good morning. Good morning, Joe. This deal would have limited how responsible the prominent Sackler family would be for any damage caused by the opioids made by Purdue Pharma. The government challenged that agreement, and now the court will hear that argument out. A massive settlement for Purdue Pharma is on hold this morning after the Supreme Court temporarily blocked the deal that would protect members of the Sackler family from more opioid-related lawsuits. Purdue Pharma made OxyContin and a lot of money for the Sackler family. The drug brought in an estimated $35 billion for the company. Using aggressive marketing tactics, millions of Americans became addicted to the opioid. Cheryl Jouer lost her two sons, Corey and Sean. I've lost my children. I've lost two of my children. That's a life sentence in itself. Such deaths led to an avalanche of lawsuits against the company and its owners. The crisis dramatized on Hulu's dope sick. So poison, that's what she did. That's just poison. Purdue Pharma filed for bankruptcy in 2019. Under the terms of the bankruptcy settlement, members of the Sackler family would be shielded from future lawsuits in exchange for $6 billion that could be used to settle opioid-related claims. But the Justice Department says the Sacklers should not be able to use legal protections designed for debtors in legal distress. The Solicitor General warning it would leave in place a roadmap for wealthy corporations and individuals to misuse the bankruptcy system. What is the issue the Supreme Court wants to look at? The Supreme Court wants to look at whether people who don't file for bankruptcy like the Sacklers but have some connection to a bankruptcy should get the benefit of a release. The bankruptcy court has done that here for the Sacklers, and the Supreme Court is deciding whether that violates the law. But for many of the families involved, there is a human toll to further delay. I know hundreds of families who have lost, hundreds, and they, they just want it over. Purdue Pharma says it is confident in the legality of the plan, and it is optimistic that the Supreme Court will uphold the current agreement. The court will hear oral arguments in the case in December and could issue a ruling next year. But in the meantime, there are millions of people still suffering. All right. And thank you so much for that report. Appreciate it. A new report on China's human rights abuses is highlighting the alleged lengths its leaders are going to to cover them up. This morning, an activist is speaking out and alleging that China is targeting critics in exile. Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons has more on this. Idris Hassan is in a prison in Morocco. His wife and young daughter, thousands of miles away in Turkey, listening in to our phone call as he tells us about his two-year nightmare. Sometimes very, I cannot breathe. Hassan was arrested by Moroccan authorities, wanted by China under an Interpol red notice, which Interpol confirms has since been dropped. 
He's a member of the mostly Muslim Uyghur minority from China. The Chinese government accused by the US of committing genocide against the Uyghurs. More than a million were put through what Beijing calls re-education camps, separating families. While in exile, Hassan campaigned against that treatment. China calls that terrorism and wants him extradited. He says he's innocent, and now his wife and three children live in fear. You must miss them. I miss very, very much my family. I have a picture of my family. I cannot see this picture. If I see this picture, I am very upset. I am crying for myself. More than 50,000 Uyghurs have sought refuge in Turkey, but they haven't escaped their fear of China. A new report obtained exclusively by NBC News documents disturbing efforts by China to allegedly target exiled Uyghurs. We have your father and sister. You'll never see them again if you don't collaborate with us, the report says one anonymous victim was told. The report by Safeguard Defenders, a non-profit human rights group highly critical of the Chinese government, describes cases like Jevlan Shememet, living in Turkey, who says his family was forced to call him from China and urged him not to speak up on human rights. When you got that phone call, did you believe that they were speaking? I know that the phone call is belonged to the Chinese police department. The report's author, Yalkun Aluyol, tells us he's a victim himself. How many of your friends and relatives have been imprisoned? Back and forth, about 30 of my relatives from my father's side. 30? On back just and, your father's back side? Back and forth, yes. Some of them uh, were detained in the camps for a few years and then released, and some of them are still serving. My father is serving 16 years in prison for nothing. My uncle is serving life sentence for nothing. My uncle-in-law, who was taken from a hospital bed, is serving 15 years in prison for nothing. The Chinese embassy in Washington tells NBC News China is ruled by law. It cannot be accused of torture, persecution or arbitrary detention against Uyghurs. It's not about human rights, ethnicity or religion. It's about fighting violence, terrorism and separatism. But this year, a UN working group concluded that detentions of Uyghurs was based on discrimination and their Muslim faith. And two years since he was arrested, Idris Hassan told us he is innocent. What do you fear will happen if you're sent to China? If you're sent to China, then you'll be caught to death for me. Because you know, China is but a UN group concluded detentions of Uyghurs was based in religious discrimination. Meanwhile, a UN appeal is delaying Hassan's extradition to China for now. Here, Simmons, thank you. Now for other headlines around the world, starting with the latest from the war in Ukraine. A Russian missile striking a hotel in Zaporizhia. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman joins us with that and other world headlines. Josh, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning. That Russian missile left a huge crater and destroyed cars at the site of a hotel in Zaporizhia, right along the Dnipro River. Ukrainian officials say at least one person was killed and 16 injured, including four children. This hotel, I've been there myself, it is widely known for being used by the United Nations and by nonprofits in Ukraine. And now the UN's humanitarian coordinator is calling the strike appalling. Now, let's go to China, where the state security ministry says it has uncovered a Chinese national suspected of spying for the CIA. China says the individual worked for a military industrial group and was recruited by a CIA agent in Italy who wined and dined the Chinese national and eventually tried to get them to turn over sensitive military information. The U.S. government, as of now, has not commented. And finally, to India, where a new film starring a hit actor is such a blockbuster that some companies are giving workers a day off to go see it. It's called Jowler, and it is the first film in two years to star actor and dancer Rajini Kanth, who has a cult-like following in India. He is no baby-faced heartthrob. He is 72 years old and has starred in more than 160 movies, and apparently more popular than ever. Guys, no kidding. That's quite the prolific career. Can 160 imagine, movies. Can you imagine American companies saying you can take the day, go do Barbenheimer? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a concept. I support it. Josh, thank you.
Well, coming up, a new warning this morning from some of the nation's top weather watchers. In a summer of extremes, more bad news. Why forecasters are now predicting above normal hurricane activity. That's next. We are back now with a new weather warning after what's already been a difficult summer season. Forecasters have revised their outlook for the Atlantic hurricane season, saying that we could now see above normal activity. Joining us now to discuss is meteorologist and hurricane specialist at WTBJ NBC6 in Miami, John Morales. John, good to have you with us. So first of all, just above normal activity. What does that mean? What do we need to know about this updated prediction? Sure, good morning to all. Uh, so normally in a hurricane season, we get 14 tropical storms out of which seven become hurricanes and three of those become major hurricanes, those really destructive category three, four and five systems. Now, NOAA updated their forecast to 14 to 21 storms. So they're definitely taking the over in betting terms, six to 11 hurricanes, up to five of them alarmingly so, major hurricanes. So this is a big pivot from where they were in the month of May when they first had their outlook for hurricane season. They had indicated at the time, NOAA had, uh, that we would have a 30% chance of an above normal season. They've doubled that to a 60% chance for what's left of this hurricane season, which lasts until November 30th. Wow. And of course, we've seen some really strong, brutal heat waves across this country. Is there a connection? Well, there's a connection with the marine heat waves that are going on right now. Uh, the Atlantic in particular is seeing an extreme, historic, record-setting uh, heat wave over the ocean. Yes, that can happen. And uh, this is a, a, a one in 41,000 chance of us seeing these type of temperatures in the Atlantic, two hundredths of 1% chance in any one year, that's the level of the sea surface temperatures that we're seeing across the Atlantic right now. And warm water fuels stronger hurricanes. So that's the concern right now. The fact that we have record heat across the uh, surface of the ocean uh, in a good portion of the Atlantic, including the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico, that could fuel the hurricanes. There's so many numbers to wrap our heads around, but I want to ask you more about something you mentioned a moment ago. Starting out May with a 30% chance of an above normal hurricane season, now it's jumped to 60%. I mean, that's a big spike. Do we normally see revisions like that, or is this something dramatic that's out of the ordinary? It's pretty out of the ordinary. Uh, uh, and normally, uh, the predictions are tweaked, not completely revised or uh, uh, like this one. Uh, listen, uh, you know, when you have a record setting event like this, I'm talking about the the warmth of the Atlantic Ocean. The it's it's just so remarkably hot, and you've seen the headlines of 100 degree water in in the Florida Keys, for example. Well, I mean, listen, it's not necessarily 100 degrees out there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, but it is record hot. And again, the warmer the water is, the easier it is to evaporate that the moisture off the surface of the ocean, and that moisture gives the tropical storms the energy to become hurricanes and potentially major hurricanes. That is the big concern. John, I got to be quick with you on this last one, but any particular areas of concern and, and what should people be doing now to prepare? Listen, uh, what I would hope for the, uh, the best would be to have a big dip in the jet stream that can deflect all of these and keep them out away from the Caribbean and away from the United States. But there's no, no guarantees here. Uh, you know, I think everybody needs to prepare and be ready for what's expected to be a hyperactive second half of the hurricane season. John Morales, uh, appreciate you helping us understand all of this. Thank you for your expertise this morning. Coming up with the worst of the pandemic now behind us, buffets. Yes, buffets are making a comeback. Jess going to tell us why more people are flocking to those all-you-can-eat self-serve restaurants. Plus, as we celebrate 50 years of hip-hop, a look at one female duo that has rewritten decades of rap's written rules. That's next. We are back with a look at new password crackdowns in the streaming world. Not what we want to hear, you know. but subscribers won't be too happy to learn Disney 
has joined the battle against password sharing. The company announcing Wednesday it's looking into tactics to stop its viewers from borrowing family and friends accounts. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk has more on what you need to know about the changing streaming landscape. Hey there, so it looks like password sharing crackdowns on some of your favorite streaming services are here to stay. Disney Plus set to follow in the footsteps of Netflix, which saw a boost in subscribers after launching its ban. And other streaming services appear ready to do the same. Want to spend the weekend binge watching your favorite shows? If you're sharing a password, get ready for a crackdown. Disney, which operates Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus, announcing it's exploring ways to monitor password sharing. We just sort of borrow a bit from those who can afford it. This move comes just months after Netflix successfully pressed pause on sharing accounts. Disney Plus and Hulu are already two of the most popular streaming services right after Netflix. So a lot of consumers clearly love the content there. And that may play into Disney's plan here. Netflix is tripping if they think I'm about to add a member. And despite some backlash. So oh, annoying. This is horrible. Business is booming. Netflix says it added nearly 6 million subscribers in the quarter after the crackdown. Oh, this is stressful. 60% of viewers have at least four streaming services, and an average household pays $54 for subscriptions monthly. Now, Disney Plus and Hulu are scheduled to hike up their prices starting October 12th. The standalone ad free version of Disney Plus expected to go up $3 to $13.99 a month. And Hulu without ads will increase by $3 a month to $17.99 a month. With password sharing and price hikes, experts say it's only a matter of time before more streaming services join in. If everyone's doing it, it's hard to ignore it. And eventually, people are going to have to decide whether or not it's worth paying for the uh, streaming service that they're watching. If you're looking to save money on your streaming subscriptions, trackers like Rocket Money can help you see everything you've signed up for in one place and cancel the ones you don't use as much. And if you can handle commercials, you can always consider switching to ad-supported plans to trim your bill. Back to you. All right, good advice, Stephanie. Thank you. More financial headlines now. California regulators have greenlit more hands-free driving for the city of San Francisco. CNBC's Pippa Stevens joins us now with more on that and other money news. Good morning, Pippa. Good morning. California regulators have voted to allow more self-driving cars on the streets of San Francisco. Cruise, which is owned by General Motors, and Waymo, which is part of Alphabet, will be able to deploy more vehicles in the city and start charging for rides day or night. It's a big win for them in their bid to expand statewide and to more U.S. cities. San Francisco has been host to thousands of self-driving car tests. And now Cruise and Waymo want to offer ride-hailing services to compete with Uber and Lyft. Meantime, the NFL is expanding its streaming service, NFL Plus, adding the NFL Network and Red Zone channel as an option this fall. It's the first time consumers can subscribe to both without a cable or satellite plan, but the upgrade comes with a big price hike. The NFL Plus premium tier will go from $9.99 to $14.99 per month, or $99 per year. The standard plan, which includes NFL Network but not Red Zone, will go from $4.99 to $6.99 per month. And Dunkin' Coffee may be a big part of your morning, but the drinks are reportedly getting a twist as the chain looks set to release a line of spiked coffee and teas. Various reports say the company got approval for new labels with the phrase Dunkin' Spiked. Dunkin' has already been in the alcoholic beverage game throughout its collaboration with Harpoon Brewery. A website for Duncan Spiked has been launched, but a release date has yet to be announced. Is there any time frame on, you know, how early you can right. start on the Duncan Spiked? <laughs> if you're in the airport yeah. anytime. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. If you're ordering on the app in the morning, just be very careful. You know, exactly. You're, like, you're drinking exactly. your drink and you're like, wait a second. All right, Pippa, thank you so much. Now look at one of the hottest trends in the restaurant business, buffets. They were hit hard by the pandemic, but buffets are bouncing back as diners look for value and variety when they go out to eat. <laughs> Buffets are like self-service gas pumps. Ooh, string beans, absolutely. But here, the fuel is food. I love seafood. Filling up empty plates 
and stomachs. I'm gifted with just like a bottomless pit, and so buffets are really perfect for that. According to Ibis World, an industry market research company, last year buffets were a $5.5 billion industry, up 9% from the year before. Why are people returning to buffets? It's family and it's budget. Restaurant expert Robin Gagnon has worked with Golden Corral, which boasts all-you-can-eat buffets for under 20 bucks a person. Amid record inflation, the chain sales were up 14% last year, while at-home food prices rose more than 11% in that same period. You have a wonderful selection of items. You're based on only one pricing. You know what it's going to cost you to get in and get out. Budget-friendly buffets are booming, serving up comfort food like mac and cheese and pizza. So are high-end options like the ones in Las Vegas focused on luxury dining. This buffet had made-to-order crepes. That includes Wicked Spoon at the Cosmopolitan. The buffet business after the pandemic has been amazing for us. It's a real creative outlet for us as chefs to, to kind of push the envelope a little. Here, weekend brunch with bottomless beverages costs $74 and includes that indulgent smorgasbord of crab legs and more. Well, I think there's something really thrilling about seeing piles of food. <laughs> Lily Jan with Cornell University says social media is feeding our appetite for buffets and our desire for experiences. What we saw when uh, restrictions started to be lifted was that people had a lot of pent up energy um, and so they were really looking forward to going out and having fun and exploring. She says the pandemic was toughest on middle of the road buffets like Sweet Tomatoes and Soup Plantation, which closed 97 stores. But higher up the food chain in Queens, New York, at a place literally called the buffet, business is fantastic. They even have a cotton candy machine and chocolate fountain. We're trying to cater to a certain type of palate, and I think we've achieved that here. And because the food speaks for itself, our customers keep coming back. Yuna Lee says her strategy, go for the seafood first, unlike me. I feel like I have an instinct at first where I'm like, I need to get fruit and salad. Fruit? Salad? What are you doing? The options, like the opinions, are endless. One other interesting note from Robin Gagnon, whose company is We Sell Restaurant. She says that buffets often serve comfort food. Times are tough for families, especially with inflation over the last year. We could all use a little food for the soul. And you said you had some advice from your family, My right? grandma always said never fill up on bread. Because, yeah, it fills you up. There. It's <laughs> yeah. interesting to hear everyone, all their parents or grandparents, have very strict advice for them. The, you the don't strategy. eat rice, you do this. You, yeah, and everyone So will you go opinions. for the seafood instead of the salad first now? Maybe I will. Yeah. I'm going to give it a shot next time. I'm just hungry. All right, thanks, Joe, for that. <laughs> well, we are celebrating all things hip-hop today in honor of the music genre's 50th anniversary. This morning, we're shining a light on a female rap duo that represents a new generation of hip-hop, and they are changing the game, redefining what it means to be a woman having power and finding financial freedom. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton joins us now with more on that. Hey, Antonia. Hey, guys. For decades, the mainstream hip-hop scene and music labels were known for sexist and exploitative behavior and a culture that would purposefully pick female performers against one another. But now the city girls, Young Miami and JT, have risen from humble beginnings in Miami to international stardom with, a, with an act that centers their friendship and satirizes the ways in which men have long degraded women in the game. Take a look. City girls from 305. Five years ago, a new rap duo emerged out of Miami with a swaggering in-your-face sound. Act up, you can get in a male-dominated industry that often elevates only one woman at a time. Best friends Carisha Brownlee and Jatavia Johnson, who go by Young Miami and JT, burst onto the scene together. I caught up with them at the Blue Lounge in LA. Here's the thing, the City Girls is about being their self. It's relatable. In the tradition of female rappers like Jackie O, Trina, and Missy Elliott, their music is boastful and raunchy. Get out, booty, pretty face. The city girls often encourage women to take advantage of men, a juxtaposition to the men in hip-hop who have long degraded women. They say growing up in poverty in Miami shaped the way they see the world and made both women determined to find financial freedom and control. Just some fun we can have to drive around. Why do those themes matter to you? Everything about Miami is money, so we always felt like we was, had to have money to be something. Like, we, it's about money. How are you keeping it all together? I mean, you just, I feel like you just have to. Like, in life, a lot of stuff will come at you fast. You got to just work. 
I always tell myself that, like, if I ever feel like, damn, I can't do something, I'm like, yes, you can. Did this or you, you got through that. Like, this is nothing. Like, you already got the means, the money. So, like, how are you gonna tell yourself you can't do it now? Only one other female rap duo has achieved the same number of platinum hits: Salt and Peppa. Hip hop historian and author Clover Hope says these women represent a generational shift. What role did women play in bringing us to this point? Not just the role, but the creation. I think about the women being uh, alongside the men, not behind them. Some argue the women are ahead. This year, not a single man was nominated for Artist of the Year for the VMAs. Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, and the City Girls have dominated the charts and become go-tos for choreographers and teachers like Naima Jackman. What draws you to the City Girls music? Uh, first of all, they're so funny. When I hear their music, I feel like it's my alter ego. But with success comes controversy and debates of double standards. They pit artists against each other. You gotta be Either. really strong-minded and not let it get in your head. I don't think they do that to the males. JT is open about time she spent in prison for fraud and now helps incarcerated women. Five years ago, young Miami was criticized for making homophobic remarks. She later apologized and has recently hinted about her own bisexuality. She's also open about her mental health after the father of her son was killed. I was like in and out. It was just like I was there, but I wasn't there. How did you get through your grief? Working, actually, it just, it kind of helped because it took my mind off of it. This week, the City Girls shot the cover for their third album, which they describe as quintessentially them. They say they never set out to be an example to others, just to be honest. That's what makes hip hop so special because it's a story and it's a feeling. Everybody's story in hip hop is the grind. Where do you think the City Girls are going to be in 10 years? On top. And music historians say that one of the reasons that women are dominating the game right now is just the internet. It has allowed acts like the City Girls to find their audience, find their voice, without the approval necessarily of male-dominated executives and Record these boardrooms yep. that used to be the gatekeepers. They're getting out there, they're getting their music out, and they don't really need anyone's permission. That's a great point. All right. Thank you so much for that story. On top. That was just a quick answer. <laughs> On top. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, still to come, if it's Friday, you know we've got your Can't Miss content for your weekend. That includes some heavy hitters from the streamers. You know, if you're over the whole Barbenheimer thing, that's coming up next. Welcome back. She is one of the most well-known stars of college basketball. She's never even played on the court. You'll recognize her. Sister Jean Dolores Schmidt Schmidt is now entering the Chicagoland Sports Hall of Fame at Loyola's University. Sister Jean, as she's best known, has become a longtime supporter of the Loyola Chicago Ramblers men's basketball team. Of course, she gained nationwide attention in 2018 when the underdog Ramblers made it all the way to the Final Four. Sister Jean, of course, cheering them on. She'll be formally inducted into the Hall of Fame in October. Even more notable, though, she'll turn 104 <laughs> later this month. Maybe they got one more run in it for her, you yes. know, coming up next March. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Finally, this hour, it's Friday, which means it's time for your weekly can't miss list. All the movies and shows you can't miss this weekend. This one is quite a mix, so there's surely something for everyone. Pop culture expert and journalist Ariel Kristen joins us now with more on what we can't miss. So let's start with one of the theaters. We're moving yes. beyond our Barbenheimer phase now, Are we? in case, well, unless you haven't <laughs> seen them yet, then check them. I still haven't seen them yet. Um, so we got two new movies out this week. One is called Jules, yes. the other, The Last Voyage of the Demeter, which I guess is like but Dracula, but he looks like a pterodactyl. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll start with Jules. <laughs> I'm actually excited to see this one. It's uh, starring Ben Kingsley, the Academy Award winning Ben Kingsley. Uh, it's a story about him. His character's name is Milton, and he is a small town guy, lives in a western Pennsylvania town, and his life kind of turns upside down when he is, discovers a UFO and alien ship that crashes in his backyard. He befriends the alien, and he names, he names him Jules. And then all of a sudden, things start to go a little crazy because his neighbors discover Jules, the uh, the government discovers jewels, but the story is like a very heartfelt story uh, about the relationship between between Ben and his and his neighbors and the alien. Now, I feel like it's X Files meets sort of like E. T. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I may have some tissues by the end of this movie. <laughs> it might be a little tearjerker, but this is definitely one to check out. Looks sweet. All right. And then the voyage of the Demeter. The voyage, uh, the last voyage of the, <laughs> the Demeter. Yeah. I am very excited about that. I am a huge horror fan. So uh, this one is about a Russian ship that is going through the treacherous waters of London when it's being haunted and stalked by some 
terrifying presence. So it stars uh, Liam Cunningham. We know him from Game of Thrones, and also uh, Corey, Hawk, uh, Corey Hawkins from uh, the Walking Dead series. So I'm very excited about that. So. Yeah, passing by Times Square. It's like on all the big yes. screens. That's, your description was perfect. <laughs> um, so the final season of Billions starts streaming yes. this weekend. A lot of people looking forward to it. What can you tell us about that? But also people don't want to see it and the spinoffs that are in the works. Yeah, well, first of all, if you have time to binge watch, you can just go ahead and start it because it's on Showtime and Paramount+. Plus. Um, it's the seventh season, as you mentioned. I mean, 91% on Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, wow. if you like Succession, for example, on HBO, you definitely will like Billions. Um, this season promises to be even more exciting exciting and backstabbing as it has been in the last seasons. <laughs> exciting. Um, yes, it stars Paul Giamatti and Damian Lewis. Uh, it is a story between the two characters that they're basically, one is a U.S. attorney and one is a hedge fund king and their battles back and forth. So if you like deception, if you like betrayal, if you like wealth and money, this is all about what you need to see. Now, there is a bunch of spinoffs because this is the last season. They have one that's entitled Millions and Trillions, apparently. Um, so <laughs> it's all about the dollar bill. And they said there's about to be four spinoffs for this. So it's oh. pretty exciting. Mine would be called 20s. <laughs> um, <laughs> ones. All right. <laughs> dollar there's bills. A, there's a docu-series about the opioid epidemic. This is yes. especially timely given the Supreme Court decision this week. But what can you tell us about Painkiller? Yes. Yeah, so Painkiller, it is a six-part series. Uh, it is dealing with... Uh, uh, fictional, fictional stories between characters that are dealing with the opioid problem that's huge, obviously, in America right now. Um, it, and it deals with the perpetrators, the victims, and the truth tellers. Um, uh, it, it's going to be something I think is going to be very powerful. It's Taylor Kitsch, it's Matthew Broderick. Um, it, it's, it's, the trailer alone looks breathtaking to me. I mean, it's definitely something that we all need to watch, and, and especially with this problem being uh, some, so big in the U.S. So this is one that's definitely going to be one to pay attention to on Netflix. That sounds important. All right, if people are in a lighter mood, uh, there's a, a new one called Red, White, and Royal Blue. What can you tell us yes, about that? Yes, Red, White, and Royal Blue. Red, White, and Ro Royal Blue is based off the novel, which the same name. Um, it is the story about the prince's son, Alex, and Britain's Prince Henry. Henry, and they have this feud that's been going on for years, but their relationship changes and it turns into sort of a love relationship that needs to be kept secret because of the two being so high profile. Uh, this is one that is definitely going to be a drama, comedy, uh, kind of heartfelt love story as well. So if you're in the mood for a nice little romance, mm. I think you should check this out. It is a great book. I don't know if you ever had a chance to read the book, but huge book for young adults in the LGBTQ plus community. Absolutely. So I'm excited to see that they're bringing it to the screen. That's great. All right. Absolutely. Ariel, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Now, see, Lindsay, your list is complete for the weekend. Right? All right. Right, you I got, got a, my plan. You, you got your homework for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.